exponentials and orders of magnitude are notoriously difficult for humans to understand, which was why I found Brad Templeton's recent Forbes article rather interesting. Tesla is this close to solving full self-driving. According to him, they only have a thousand times further to go. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This video is thanks to Conrad Schmidt for pointing out the uh, Brad Templeton article to me and asking for my reaction. So uh, since Stephen Mark Ryan over on Solving the Money Problem has had a really good run of doing reaction videos, I thought I would give it a try. Now, admittedly, this is an article and not a video, so it may not be quite as exciting to look at text as opposed to watching video. I'll give it a shot and we'll see what happens. Also, I want to make a note. I wrote down notes as I was reading the article, so it was actually real time, but of course I'm reading off of notes right now. So let's start with the title. I understand what he's talking about, but hadn't really thought about it in the way he's discussing it before. And it's actually a little bit depressing if you realize if you're chasing the nines, at least according to his contention, is that Tesla needs to hit 99.9999% of perfection. Currently, they're at 99.9% .9 of perfection or, or good enough, I suppose. I immediately, upon reading the title, like thought I might take some issue with that because who knows that 99.99% is not perfectly fine. So his assertion that it might be three or four more digits was just his assertion. And we'll get into that later as I continue to read the article. So of course the article relates to the full self-driving beta rollout that happened on October 22nd, I believe. Anyway, this article is dated October 23rd, which I have to admit, puts it in dinosaur years with Tesla because everything happens so fast with them. I also have to admit that I, right around the same time, I think on the 23rd, also released an article saying, what on earth is Tesla doing releasing the software? I got so much flack on the internet that I had to go and retract it in another video and kind of say like, oops, I'm sorry, you guys were right. So I'll link those two if you're interested in watching the saga. But certainly full self-driving is updating rapidly, so even being about 17 or so days old at the time I filmed this, there's, you know, some <laughs> out-of-dateness. But still, I think the arguments that he makes in here are quite valid to examine because there are some specious arguments and it's worth pointing them out. First of all, Brad Templeton says this is not actually full self-driving, even though it's called full self-driving. It's more like autopilot for city streets. I completely agree with this. I think it's dangerous for Tesla to proclaim this is full self-driving when it's not there yet. I, I wish they had another name for it. Uh, even autopilot is a problematic term. I think it's in Germany where they're not allowed to use that term because apparently it sounds too much like it's going to fly itself, right? Of course, with every iteration, and especially with full self-driving to beta, it's less of an issue now because it's much more complete, but still, you know, it, this is, absolutely requires attention on the driver's part, and you have to agree to that before you're even allowed to download and use the software. One thing that Brad notes is that it, the full self-driving still doesn't do driveways or parking lots, and I'm actually curious about that. Again, I've got my Model 3 on order. <laughs> you can check out that, but I haven't gotten it yet, and so I'm curious if anybody else has used the beta if they notice that it actually does work with driveways or parking lots now. I'd be curious to find out. But anyway, according to Templeton, that's not the case yet. Brad then goes on to compare Tesla in 2020 to Waymo in 2010, which I was like, what is he talking about? So it turns out that he actually worked it for Waymo, um, which means I think there's a decent chance that he's being biased here. But even he notes that they were using LiDAR and completely explicitly mapped areas to do their testing. So come on. I mean, that's an, that's an unfair comparison between the two of them over the decade. And obviously, as most of you know, Tesla only uses vision and radar and sonar and doesn't use LiDAR at all. And they can pretty much do it everywhere without having to have a walled garden of completely mapped out stuff. Templeton then notes that they have driven in the day and the night in the full self-driving, but no harsh weather. As far as I know, I haven't seen any snow driving yet. I have seen some rain driving and it seems to handle that pretty well, but it really will be interesting to see how full self-driving deals with like a, a, a sizable snowstorm. That will be a significant challenge. And by the way, who's brave enough to try that? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody want to risk their 50 or 60 or $70,000 car on a snowy road with autopilot full self-driving? <laughs> Next, he discusses disengagements, and this is a quote from uh, Templeton here, quote, while no statistics are available about how frequently those are needed, it appears to be reasonably frequent, unquote. I think it should be frequently, actually. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't agree with this. I think that disengagement, even in the earliest test, was not all that frequent, and often it just showed that the driver was being overly cautious and not that the car was necessarily going to get into an accident. 
Uh, and certainly in the week since the article, the, the full self-driving has gotten significantly better and it's demonstrably better. So, you know, as many like, you know, half hour long full self-driving with no disengagement videos show. So I would say without better statistics, this is kind of a specious argument he's making here. Again, Templeton here mentions Waymo and Neuro and Cruise as needing no supervising driver on board. This is a bad faith argument. Again, these are only available in tiny walled garden areas, like a couple of square miles in Phoenix for Waymo and San Francisco for Cruise. And Cruise isn't even operating yet. So it's, it's kind of a bad faith argument to make a comparison between that and driving on unmapped roads all across the United States at this point and soon to roll out to the world at large. So now he gets to referencing the title of 99.9%. .9%. Quote, this is not a precisely calculated number, but a proxy for seems to work most of the time. In reality, we would want to calculate how often it is needing interventions. End quote. So I agree about that, but then your title is more clickbaity than it is any kind of precise argument or indication of real progress. So honestly, it kind of diminishes the article and makes it seem a little more like a BuzzFeed article than an actual, you know, Forbes quality article. After this, Templeton turns to five points, five questions, and inserts his thoughts about the answers to those questions. Number one, how frequent are disengagements? Again, to quote him, quote, one can't tell from just these videos, end quote. But he does pull out some real statistics next, which I actually really approve of. I did not know all of these statistics as precisely as he does. Apparently, humans make a bad mistake that could cause an accident about 100,000 every 100,000 miles or 8 to 10 years of driving for a normal person. So much of the time we're lucky, right? We go into the wrong lane and nobody's there and so we don't have an accident. But that happens about every 100,000 miles. As far as insurance claims, that happens about every 250,000 miles or every 25 human years. As far as police intervention, in other words, a significant accident, that's about every 500,000 miles or 40 to 50 human years. And fatalities are every 8,000 years of driving or about 20,000 years on the highway. So for individuals, that's a very, very small chance that you would be involved in a fatality. Thank goodness, right? Thank goodness human drivers are relatively good. But then Brad goes on to state, quote, driving all day without needing an intervention seems very impressive, particularly to those new to the field. But it's a very long way from where you need to be for actual full self-driving rather than monitored driver assistance, end quote. But he has zero statistics on whether or not full self-driving is better or worse in this case. He just has a statement that he's making sound like fact. But really, are we a long way off? How far are we off? What are the full self-driving statistics that we can compare to this human driving? He doesn't have any of that. Question number two he deals with is, is it okay to test with untrained drivers? Again, I worried about this too in the linked videos and people crushed me about it. So anyway, I've changed my mind about it. Let's just put it that way. But he compares the Tesla driving to the Uber fatality, the very unfortunate Uber fatality that happened with a poorly trained driver trainer watching a video rather than paying attention to the road and killing a pedestrian and how drivers of Tesla will do similar things. Okay, yes, but Uber paid this person and it was their job and it was Uber's responsibility for the training. This is completely different. With Tesla, you are responsible, right? This is a driver assist thing, no matter whether it says full self-driving or not. It is a driver assist feature. You are responsible. You are legally responsible for your car. So this is not an apples to apples comparison at all. Plus, of course, full self-driving beta is clearly identified as a beta and everybody knows a beta is not completed software. So people should be extra careful in that case. At this point, Templeton references an article stating, quote, statistics show that Tesla drivers using autopilot on the highway are not as safe as drivers not using autopilot, but only moderately less safe, end quote. Let's look at that article. Oh, he wrote the article. And oh, when you actually read the article, you find out that it's just guesstimation calculations that kind of show that on freeway miles, Teslas are slightly less safe, assuming that he guessed all of the numbers correctly and his calculations are correct. That's a really disingenuous thing to state like it was a scientific study or something in this article. You don't call it statistics if it's just guesses and also clearly identify that you were the writer of the previous article, not some full blown scientific study that actually has real statistics. Boo on Templeton for that one for sure. Of course, Templeton does state next that having careful drivers test the software for free, well, actually we pay for it, right, <laughs> is a good thing because there are many, many more miles of curated data fed to the machine learning beast than with companies like Waymo or Cruise or, or Neuro that have to pay their drivers to drive these miles. 
So of course this saves Tesla millions of dollars and they get a lot more edge cases from people driving random places. Question or point number three is about corner or edge cases. So Templeton states that even at 99.9%, .9%, which is his numbers, there are still many, many edge cases, even on normal streets. Yeah, I agree with that, right? There's random stuff. There's a tree that falls into the road or a truck is parked someplace or a dog runs out or who knows. There's a lot of edge cases that come along. But then Templeton states that Waymo has already taken care of this. Now, come on now, right? Again, we're inside a very carefully mapped walled garden. So absolutely, it's going to do better because it, it's basically given all, you know, it's given all the secrets. So this is not a comparison that's fair at all. If you see my linked video up here, you will see that this is not a scalable thing for Waymo or Cruise or anybody else to do. Whereas Tesla's is scalable and actually as it scales, it gets better. So that's an opposite thing. So it's a very, very poor comparison to make. Then Templeton states that we're only one tenth of 1% 0.001 of the way there. Again, this is totally specious. 99.9% .9 is 99.9%. .9 you don't start at 99.9 .9 and have to get to 99.9999. <laughs> I think that's right. You start at zero to get there. So by his logic, we're about halfway there, right? That's three nines out of six nines that you need. So that's to say that we're a thousand times further away is completely bogus and boo on him for stating that. In just a minute, I'm going to get to points four and five. But first, if you enjoy the video, definitely make sure you hit the thumbs up button because YouTube's algorithm depends on that for recommending it. And if you enjoy this kind of thing, be sure to subscribe so you can watch more of these. Also, a shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. I have a couple of new ones since last time. JKEV, Paul G, and Andrew Hart. Thank you, everybody. I truly appreciate it. Also, a quick shout out to Zenly for doing my silly music for me. He's actually a super talented musician and producer. So please check him out and show him some love on his YouTube channel that you can either search in the description or just look for Zenly music on YouTube. And if you're in the market for a new Tesla, feel free to use our referral link also in the description. You and we both get 1000 free supercharger miles. So that's a win win. On to point four. Point four is maps and LIDAR. So uh, Templeton is still stating that not using LiDAR is controversial. I, I think that issue has been put to bed. <laughs> if nothing else, getting to full self-driving too has really put that issue to bed. Vision seems to work just fine and it's much less fragile and it's much, much, much cheaper. And as Elon Musk said, it is a crutch to use LiDAR. It's not gonna get you everywhere because again, you have to map out every single place you're going. And that's very expensive and time consuming. And frankly, it changes all the time. So doing it on the fly is a much more reasonable solution. If you check out my trajectory projection video up there, you'll see that vision is enough to create a false, <laughs> false LiDAR map, a 3D map of surroundings. It's also super robust. It can do it in real time and it's continuous. So it keeps track of things and it doesn't lose them every frame. So it is effectively creating a map and it's doing it a, a better job because it's a more flexible map because it's doing it right now instead of depending on something that was done before. As far as mapping is concerned, what he's talking about here, at least I think he doesn't say it specifically, but I believe he's talking about extremely highly detailed LIDAR maps of areas, not like Google Maps, right? Google Maps <laughs> kind of stuff exists all over the place already. But he argues that, quote, it is much too soon to think about doing without them, the maps, end quote. But full self-driving beta is showing that this is not at all the case. Again, the cars handle these new situations and unmapped areas actually extremely well. And their lower level mapping that they do achieve as they drive in certain areas helps them and other cars as they drive in it and they encounter those situations again. So they can improve, but they just don't need those super highly detailed, fragile maps. Templeton argues that perfect on the fly mapping is not possible, so maps are needed, but yeah, but lower resolution maps are adequate for full self-driving because they can be filled in by on-the-fly calculations. He shows one bad example, but that's not statistics, that's an anecdote. And also this was the first day of a new beta release and a beta is never promised to work pro properly at all. So, you know, it's getting better and it uses these cases, in fact, to train itself. And so I think that this is, again, a specious argument to say that we have to have high resolution maps. I do not believe that that's necessary. And finally, point five, is this even legal? So there's some merit to this question, but I think the way that he goes about it is not the right way of approaching it. So what he notes is that California requires a special permit to train and or use a self-driving car. And that makes sense if you're doing it, again, when you're sitting in the back seat with your laptop or something. But Tesla's full self-driving is not 
stated to be that even though it says full self-driving and I think the name is bad it's clearly a driver assist feature so things like autopilot or adaptive radar cruise control or things like that are driver assist features and they do not require special permitting in California so they are legal and it's quite clear even though it says full self-driving it's quite clear when you read the agreement that you are responsible and you have to keep your hands on the wheel etc etc you have to be paying attention to the road so this is still driver assist very much so it's definitely legal in California in this case. Yes, the name is kind of goofy, but <laughs> but regardless of that, in terms of legality, yes, it's definitely legal. So that's a specious argument. Now, I think there's an ethical argument to be made, and that was what I said in my original video and got shot down, was that uh, you're putting your drivers at risk. But honestly, given how good it looks, it appears to be like it might actually have some safety factors involved. So, you know, I think there's an ethical issue, sure, but a legal issue, no, because the driver is definitely still legally responsible for the car. So what are my overall thoughts on this article? I think the title is clickbait. Boo on that. That's Forbes. They shouldn't be doing that. I think that Templeton believes he's arguing in good faith in the article, but he also is clearly biased towards Waymo and Cruz and Nero. Uh, that they're somehow at the same level, or actually he's claiming they're better than Tesla. They are not. They have fully mapped walled garden areas that they can drive within that are very fragile to any changes. That is not the same thing as what Tesla is doing. Tesla is driving everywhere around the United States and soon around the world without even necessarily having to have been there before and mapped it. So that is a whole different ball game and Tesla is leaps and bounds ahead. This is something that is scalable, whereas Waymo and Cruise, etc., are not scalable using the method that they're doing. I think it's quite clear that Tesla has proven that vision plus radar and sonar systems can completely map adequately on the fly. Legally, the driver is still responsible up until the day the car no longer needs them. <laughs> at that point, it, it's a whole different ballgame. But at this point, it's absolutely legal because it's a driver assist package. And finally, we are at least halfway to solving full self-driving by Brad's own logic if we're 99.9% .9 of the way to 99.9999% of the way. We are not one-tenth of 1% of the way there. We're very, very close. And for most situations, we're actually already there. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, definitely make sure you like it so other people can find it and subscribe for more of these. And please do ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.